in this morning's discussion, some of the comments uh, that were made and the individual ones, one of the aspects of teaching the Holocaust is how do you engage a 13-year-old in Kansas City or a 17-year-old in Paducah someplace else uh, or Wisconsin with something so totally out of his context, so totally out of his world. Uh, something, an event that uh, took place seven decades ago across the sea, which of course the world ends uh, someplace, you know, if from Kansas it ends about in, in Chicago, I guess. <laughs> you know, when you, in New York you end out on Long Island, that's the end of the world, it drops off. Uh, with horrors, that's a tremendous problem. How do you engage him? And besides this, if you show them just the horror of it, and that's one of the aspects that they might, ideas of uh, how do you present visualization. And, and we do use some pretty horrific, horrific stuff. But then again, the problem I sometimes face with that is most of our students and ourselves have seen, quote, horror movies, right? Mm -hmm. Now, but we know internally it's fiction. We know that. So how do I use the horror, or maybe I shouldn't use horror, because he thinks it's fiction. It's so beyond anything. So how do you do that? Well, let me tell you how I see it. Well, there's one other small detail, and speaking of Addy. Uh, my wife Addy was an educator. I would say, uh, being somewhat um, prejudicial maybe, <laughs> the ultimate educator. <laughs> it's not a question. Uh, she knew children, she knew adults. Uh, I learned a lot from her. In fact, the first piece of educational material I got on a Saturday night, uh, she announced to me, we were going out at the time, we were both about, she was like 16, I was like about 18 or so, and she said, we're not going out tonight to a movie, we're going to a lecture. <laughs> really. <laughs> this set the stage. <laughs> we went to a place called the Educational Alliance, which uh, still exists uh, down on the Lower East Side, and a gentleman by the name of William Kilpatrick spoke. Uh, William Kilpatrick, for those of you who are not familiar with him, was a disciple of someone by the name of John Dewey, but I'm sure you do know. And this very distinguished gentleman stated something that, of course, in my very limited English, and it was believed it was very limited, he said that you can't teach anyone anything new. You can merely extend their knowledge and understanding both horizontally and vertically. So after Eddie explained to me what horizontal means and vertical, mm -hmm. I began to understand that it means that you have you been able to extend things to other things which relate to it, and vertically meaning in more depth. And that really is the way I see education. So what I really want to do is to take a student or a human being, whether he is 13 years old, seven years old, or 97 years old, and acquaint him with something he knows nothing about is to things he does know. Now, what does the student, what does our student really know? He knows about many things. He lives in a free and loving society. Most of us, give or take a little bit. He knows about what he owns, but he also knows about laws. That's something that we all know. Sometimes you just misplace things and we think we lost them, right? And then there's the loss that some of my best friends who moves across the country, you know, I used to live in a nice place called New York, now he lives in a strange place called California. <laughs> and I don't see him again, it's a different world. So I know the idea of loss, I know what it feels like to lose something. I know something about restrictions, because the teacher says, no, you cannot chew gum in my class. <laughs> but I like to chew gum, but you can't chew gum. So in this class, I don't chew gum. So you know something about what restrictions are. We know about things like betrayal. We know what betrayal feels like. I mean, you know, just imagine you've been a friend with this person 
since nursery school and then kindergarten, the two of you went together, there's two wonderful girls, they went together through all this, and now you're in high school, you're 17 years old, and you have a boyfriend. Your a best friend, uh, Sandy, does not have a best boyfriend. She proceeds to steal your boyfriend. That's known in ordinary parlance as betrayal. So we know every student has some form of betrayal, knows something about it. We know about things, loosely speaking, of bystanders. There have been moments in my class, in my playground, when someone picked on somebody, and I did nothing. Then there was a time where somebody was picking on somebody, and it was my best friend or my brother, and I proceeded to beat the living daylights out of him. I've done that. And there were times that I really sort of felt like I want to really pick on somebody. I became the bully. So we know what some of those aspects are. So these are the things that we as human beings and as children, we have all these feelings. So my approach to this whole thing is to connect the student to me, but connect them with a time and place which he can relate to. So obviously I begin the story of my life by saying I was born to a family. I had a father and a mother. More or less, like most of the people are born the same way. It takes about nine months, give or take a couple. And there I am, come on the scene, right? So what happens to this thing? So here I am a baby, so everybody knows what a baby is like. So I say, well, I'm the second child. And as a ch second child, uh, obviously, there's an older child. So my parents, being somewhat intelligent, I suppose, uh, realize that when you have a second child, uh, and the, sec the second child needs care. And therefore, my older brother stops being the king. Mm -hmm. So to mitigate that a little bit, they decided, because they were financially well, off, well enough off, so they decided the thing to do is to get someone to take care of this crying little creature. So this way we can devote more time to our older son. So therefore, at age 10 days or thereabouts, I come home from the hospital. And by the way, 10 days used to be yeah. in the hospital. Then. Not the 24 hours, but the HMO <laughs> hours. So it's a little better than that. <clears throat> and so I come into a household with a nanny. So my life begins with having someone who takes care of me fully and completely. So at age three or four, I begin to relate to another human being, to an adult in particular. But this adult is very kind and gentle and sweet and doesn't scream at me and does everything I want. So my, my life begins with this wonderful person called Ergi. Ergi was my lifeline to the world. And obviously, I have an older brother, and we fight sometimes, and I break his toy sometimes, and you know, all the stuff that happens. I talk about this. And I tell them about my life, the way I start my life, and I have this wonderful lady, and it's wonderful. My life is wonderful. I tell them about the fact that I lived in a household with her parents, and grandparents, and energy. Living with grandparents is not the norm in America these days. You don't usually have three generations. But I tell them that if you can live in a, in a place where you have three generations, a hell of a lot better. The reason why it's better is because as a child, you want things. And there are times your father or mother will tell you, no, you can't have a new iPod. So what do you do? Yes, I give them yeah. advice. My advice is you talk to your grandfather, tell him how much you love him. <laughs> how wonderful he is. And you would love to go for a walk. Yeah. And somehow you wind up in the store. Yeah. And you don't. So I give this advice to them freely. And all of them chuckle because all of them uh, say, now, how many of you have ever used this technique? Yeah. Every hand goes up, obviously. So what I try to do first is establish a relationship. Yeah. And I tell them about some of the things that happened to me as a child. Uh, as a, you know, getting into trouble, I tell them a story. And those of you who had the chance to read uh, my memoir, if you read the story about the violin, uh, you understand that uh, what uh, 
a disappointment, something of that nature can be. Those of you who haven't, you read it. It's not that critical uh, to this discussion. And I tell them about my school days, about the fact that I love to play soccer, and now they understand. 50 years ago, most people in America never heard of it. Now almost every school has a soccer team. And so we talk about the position I played. I tell them about the fact that I lived in a city of about 7,000 people made up of Catholics and Protestants and Jews and Russian Orthodox and Gypsies. Living in a community, uh, there was no area where Jews lived or Catholics lived or Protestants lived. Everybody lived where they could afford to live. And you could have a very big house next to a small house, next to a house which had four apartments and a whole bunch of people lived there and so on. And there were streets and there were stores and, and there was a, a two railroad stations, one for freight and one for uh, passenger. And there were churches and synagogues. I described the town to them so they have a, a sort of physical feeling of what the topography is, the fact that we had a, a tennis courts that had paved sidewalks and paved roads and we had a place to swim in the summertime and ice skating ring in the winter time and a soccer stadium. So I tried to relate them to this total geography, topography of this place and where it was located within this country called Czechoslovakia. And I gave them a little bit of a hint of what Czechoslovakia was. The fact that Czechoslovakia was a country which was born for the first time in 1918 and the fact that it was a democracy. <coughs> It was modeled somewhat on America. The reason for it is because uh, the first president of this country called Czechoslovakia was a fellow by the name of Thomas Masaryk, who spent many, many years at a place called the University of Chicago teaching political science. And he observed America and he knew America. And he tried to bring to Czechoslovakia the idea of equality, of equal opportunity. And therefore, a Jew or a Catholic or a Protestant could be a, could be a doctor or a lawyer and could live any place and he could go into any business and he could be a teacher. So there was a sense of, so I grew up, I grew up in, as, my, as a child in this idea of freedom. I can go any place I want. I can, within the limits of what, what my parents said, and sometimes beyond the limits of what my parents said. <laughs> That too happens, and you hope you don't get caught. <laughs> so I, this is where I live. So therefore, this student says to himself, oh my god, not that much different from me. I did get caught once, climbing a fence and stealing some apples from the neighbor's yard, and my father yelled at me. Uh, so I can relate to this person, to his life. And then the question is, well, here you are, 10 years old, it's 1939, and the world's coming, falling apart. It's unraveling. How did you know? I mean, what 10-year-old, there may be some, knows the geopolitics of the world? So how did you know? I see, I didn't. I was more concerned about who won the soccer game than I was about who is elected to what. But I'm 10 years old, it's 1939, and this country called Czechoslovakia suddenly no longer exists. Why? Because a Ger the German army marched into the western part, took over Czechoslovakia, and becomes part of Germany. Different country. I live in the eastern part, it becomes a new country called Slovakia. And this country has a different government. This country doesn't think of me as an individual who is equal to everybody else. So one day, in the summer of 1939, since summertime I don't go to school, I go to play with my friends. And I get to the gate of the park, and there's a sign, a new sign. It says, Jews and dogs are forbidden to enter. So, wait a minute. I'm just like everybody else. My friends who are not Jewish can go in, I can't go in. There's some restriction which I don't fully appreciate. And one day in the winter of 1939, my father tells me, the jacket you've been wearing, you can no longer wear. In fact, you can't even own it. 
we have to take it to the police department. I said, my jacket, because this particular jacket has a fur lining, it's a sheepskin jacket, and therefore sheepskin is a luxury, and Jews are not allowed to have luxuries. So here I am 10 years old, and something near and dear to me is taken away from me, because of who I am. And I said to the kids, and those of you who are familiar with this marvelous new thing that kids come to school with, in the winter time particularly, called Uggs. <laughs> <laughs> You've heard of Uggs? Uh -huh. I see them all the time. They're wonderful, actually, I'm told. <laughs> they are. <laughs> they're, they're, they're warm and your feet don't perspire. We them for here. <laughs> right. <laughs> So, uh, so I we sort of talk about Uggs. I say, imagine you got a pair of Uggs last week for your birthday, and this morning you walk in, and at the front of the school stands a policeman. He says, oh my God, you have blue eyes and blonde hair. No Uggs. Anyone who has blue eyes and blonde hair is not allowed to have Uggs, so take them off. They sort of, the girls particularly look at me like, just a minute. <laughs> you don't do that. So suddenly they begin to understand this relationship. This, he says, I'm a kid, and they put themselves into that position. They begin to feel for me. They begin to have emotions to the events that are taking place. Not just absorbing some of the facts and figures. They begin to emote in some way. So I begin to tell them about that. And I then I tell them about the fact that, you know, Jews were not allowed to go out at night. We all go to the movies at night, usually, because we work during the day. What do you mean you can't go, can't go to the movies? Well, really, we could go to the movies in 1939, in the beginning of 1940. The only thing is, we had to sit in a separate place. There was a Jew bench. Now, they know what that means, some of them. Some of them don't. Some of them, well, obviously, most of our students don't remember that, but you know, most, some of, uh, some of us may. <laughs> very few of us here. Yeah. Very few of you guys. You're too young to remember any of this. So we understand that. And then I tell them about this particular day. It's September of 1940. And like every other child in the Northern Hemisphere, something takes place the first week in September, like you show up at work, right? And the kids show up at school. So no difference in 1940, I'm 11 years old, I passed my exams in June, got promoted, and I'm ready to go back to school. And I get to the gate of the school, and the principal stands there, and he looks at me and says, Roth, you can't go in. We don't want any Jews in our school, we don't allow Jews to go to our school. So the students will have this vision as you do. Imagine your principal, who is usually locked up in his office or her office, right? Standing out there and says, you can go in, you cannot go in, you cannot go in. My friends go in. My teacher who is not Jewish goes right in. I stand there, I become invisible. We know what being ignored means. We have an emotion towards that. So the important aspect of that is this emotional relationship. So they see this image at one point, and simultaneously, they relate to it. So that becomes an important aspect of me telling the story to them. And of course, I tell them about the fact that the Jews weren't allowed to shop during the day. Between 3 and 4 in the afternoon, Jews could go shopping. So imagine if you run out of milk at 7 o'clock in the morning and you can't make coffee because you have no milk, too bad. If you're a Jew, you don't get served. So this is the kind of things I tell them. Now, then I tell them about also about the fact that this affected uh, not just children. This affected adults, too, in different ways, like shopping, of course. The other thing, I had to be recognized. What do you mean by recognize? The way I recognize people is by the way they look, right? By face. You know, I know some of you. Please. Very quickly, within a day or two, you knew who everybody was. You look at the face and you, you don't even need a tag. Although I'm very happy when people have tags. Because... 
but that's not what I mean. I used to be an individual by the name of Irving Roth. Now I'm no longer Irving Roth. So if a per person sees me 20 feet away or 30 feet away, if they look at the face, Irv Roth, right? It's a small city, not more. Now I'm something else. 50 yards away, he can see me and recognize me. Not as Irving Roth, but as a Jew. Why? Because I wear this big yellow star. So therefore, I stop having an identity. I'm no longer a person with a name, with a characteristic, the fact that I'm a top-notch, superb soccer player. I'm a star. So they know what that means. Like when you refer to them as those kids. So that's another. Now, of course, there are other aspects too to this thing that suddenly you become a person who has no name anymore, who is not. But the economics also are changing. For instance, one of the things that happened, the Jewish attorneys were not allowed to practice law. And sometimes I speak to schools where you have a whole bunch of parents who are attorneys. Doctors, Jewish doctors were not allowed to take care of non-Jewish patients. In fact, they lost there are privileges in hospitals. And then there is a rumor. Jews are not allowed to own a business. So I tell them about my father's business. My father was in an interesting business. It's essentially a lumber business, but only very specialized lumber business. What he did is uh, we, he would buy 50, 60 acres of forest the trees of the forest, actually. And they would bring in hundreds of people who chop the trees down and make railroad ties out of it. And the railroad ties were sh then taken from the forest to the railroad station and shipped all over Europe. But the rumor is that Jews are no longer allowed to own that. So the question is, what do you do? You try to prevent this, right? A form of resistance, if you will. So my father, realizing that this is a dangerous situation, he, of course, having lived in this society, in this particular place, in this area for many years, having many friends, both Jews and non-Jews alike. One of his very good friends, who in fact, he was the uh, best man at my parents' wedding in 1924, a fellow by Albert. You'll meet him uh, as you read the memoir. So my father and Albert are having this conversation, actually my grandfather was involved too, saying, you know, there's this, this rumor. Now, Albert was a wonderful man, uh, with a nice family, he was a Roman Catholic, and, uh, but a very dear friend. Imagine he was the best man at parents' wedding. So he sort of, you know, uh, he was actually, he signed the document because you have, to, you have a marriage certificate. He was one of the two witnesses. Uh, so my father and Albert and my grandfather talk about this whole situation, and, and the three of them come up with a marvelous scheme. Why don't prevent, why don't we prevent this? How do you do it? Well, <laughs> Very simple. We'll transfer the business to Albert. Brilliant solution. Yeah, what does it take? It takes a document which is signed, notarized, maybe an attorney writes it, and suddenly it's no longer Roth and Rosenwasser, and now it's Melesnik Incorporated. And there's no problem. Why? Because he's a friend, he's lending his name to this enterprise, and uh, everything is terrific. Clever. Three months go by, and one day Albert comes to see my father. And he says, uh, Joe, we're partners. So I think it's only fair that I take half the profits. <laughs> and another three months go by, and Albert comes by. Joe, I like the way you're running my business. I'm not going to fire you. You cannot be manager. Since you can't get a job anyway. Manage my business. You're doing a good job. You know how to run it. The profits are mine. That's called betrayal. Your students will understand that. So this is oppression of different kinds. This is economic oppression. Now, of course, this is not 1942. And by 1942, if, you, if students have had any historical background, know what was happening in 1942. They know about the fact that there was a conference in a place called Wanzhou, 
is that they, at this point already the uh, leadership of the Nazi party already has decided to build death camps. So there are death camps in Poland. And then I say, okay, so now the Slovak government says to itself, wait a minute, we restricted the Jews, true. We took away their businesses. Do we really need them? Let's get rid of them. And not only that, we know that our good friends, the Germans, have built these death camps. So why don't we talk to them and figure out how we take our 70,000 Jews or 60,000 Jews and get rid of them? And once and for all, there'll be no Jews. So they negotiate a contract. The Slovak government will deliver the Jews to the border of Poland, where the German government will get to dispose of them. But now they have to somehow get these Jews to Poland. So you have 2,000 Jews living in this city called Humene in the eastern part of Slovakia. And you need to put them into some kind of enclosure or get and put them onto some kind of a vehicle and get rid of them. So my city has almost 2,000 Jews. So on a Friday night when all the Jews are home, you knock on every single Jewish home and you give them 10 minutes to pack and you march them to some place where they can be arrested. So you normally would think of a jail, but remember, this is a city of 7,000 people. The jail has two jail cells. Well, but you need an enclosure, because if you don't have an enclosure, they're liable to run away. So what do you do? Well, you find a place which can hold that many people. Uh, it's called the synagogue, since no one else needs it, except for the Jews. So they march the Jews into the synagogue. 1,800 of the 2,000 Jews are inside the synagogue. The synagogue is locked and awaiting to be transported someplace until the train comes in. It happens to be the synagogue was a very beautiful place, except for once a couple of small details. It didn't have any running water or bathrooms. Uh, it also normally had only 650 people occupied it. So now you have 1,700. So you can imagine the crowded nature of it and the fact that here you are for a day and a half locked into this place. Just imagine for a moment, and I tell the students, you're sitting in an enclosure like this. Imagine in this room we have 200 people and the doors are locked and there's a guy with a submachine on there making sure you can't get out for a day and a half. I need not explain to the students what it's like. We have biological functions. Mm -hmm. Humiliation. After a day and a half, the Jews have marched out under guard to the train station, put into the cattle cars, and off they go. Gone. Erberoth doesn't. Why? Because Erberoth's father is still running Albert's business. And he's still, Albert temporarily at least needs him and wants him. And there's special certificates, and that's a very complicated issue. You'll read about it, how that happens. But anyway, the Roth family, my father and mother, my brother and I, and my grandparents are left there. So out of the 2,000 kids, 2,000 people, 200 left. Therefore, the school is sort of gone, right? Yeah, but the Jewish community, like any other community, when it has problems like that, they try to do something. One of the things you need is a teacher. What are the kids going to do, right? The few kids who are left. So they convince the police department uh, to make sure that uh, one teacher is left. So the next day, we go into the synagogue, got to do something about it because you can imagine what it looked like. And the holidays are coming, it's in the summer of 1942. And uh, here we are. Question is, are we going to stay for a month or a week? Don't know. But now you have, the Jews are gone, all their apartments and houses are there. And they're full of furniture, right? What are you going to do with it? Well, let's sit there. Well, like any city, there's always a budget problems. So what do you do? You hold an auction. You know, remember you had about 2,000 Jews, about maybe 350, 400 households. So now you have, you have tables and chairs and couches and, you know, all the good stuff. Now, mind you, the Jews were picked up by the police department, a few helpers from the fascist party, 
and some soldiers during the night who participated. Well, maybe 50 people, 75 people. The rest of the town slept, right? I mean, what do you do in the middle of the night? You sleep. You don't worry about what's going on outside. So, in effect, most of the people in the town slept through this whole thing. They were not involved directly or indirectly. Therefore, they were what we term sometimes bystanders, right? Or by sleepers. <laughs> but now you have an auction. So the town crier announces, hear ye, hear ye, right? Tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock in front of Rosberg's yard, there's going to be an auction. All the people showed up. Are still bystanders? No. <laughs> okay. So I tell you this because it's important to recognize how people react. Were they forced to be there? No. Did they participate? Bet you about a they did. So now the Jews are gone. We're still there. We don't know what's going to be happening. A month goes by. Another two families are gone. Another few families are gone. This is dangerous stuff. Sooner or later, we're going to be taken to. So you've got to do something. You've got to prepare for these things. My family decides that the only thing to do is to disappear. Where do you disappear? You know, you just don't disappear off the face of the earth. You have to go someplace. Turns out, and this is where a map, somebody was talking about the map, comes in. If you look at the map of Europe, you find Slovakia is over here. Right underneath Slovakia, south of it, is a country called Hungary. Above it is Poland. Hungary was an interesting country. Hungary was a mm, republic, sort of. It had a guy who was in charge, like a regent. His name was Horty. And his government, although very anti-Semitic, in fact, the first anti-Jewish law to be passed after World War I in Europe was in Hungary, limiting the number of Jews that are allowed to go to universities. So they were not exactly what you would call the friendliest of countries in that sense, but the Jews were part of the community. And they had a place there. They were involved in economics and many things. Hungary says, yeah, no, no, we're not going to get rid of the Jews. That's silly. We're going to use them. It's a stupid idea to kill them. Use them. They're worthwhile. What we'll do, and this is what they actually do, they organize a labor battalions of Jews. Now, mind you, this is World War II is going on. So there are soldiers on the front line. But soldiers need help. Like digging trenches, like shining boots, like cooking, like cleaning horses, all the things that need to get done. Build roads, repair bridges. Well, get the Jews between the ages of 18 and 45 or 50, in, get them into this labor force, and they'll be able to do all that work, and therefore the soldiers can fight. So what, that's what they're going to do. And that's, in fact, what happens in Hungary. Rather than shipping the Jews any place, they take the Jewish men, put them into this labor battalion, and they're off with the army. And of course, they're treated very badly. They don't have enough food. Some guys treat them halfway decently. So there's a variation. Uh, if you want to see a good movie on that, it's called Sun and, Sunshine or Sun and Shine? Sunshine. It's a Hungarian movie. It's about Hungary. Uh, three generations. A very interesting movie you get a sense of uh, the Jews of Hungary, who, by the way, thought of themselves as Hungarians. They were true Magyars, they thought. Uh, they were, most of them were assimilated. But so now the Jews in Hungary are safe. It is a fascist country, and the Jews are at home, except for the men who are there, but it's a safe haven. So we managed to get across the border into Hungary. How we do this? Details, you'll read it, so you know, I don't have to tell you about it. So here I am. Now I'm in Hungary. I'm all of now. This is 1943. I'm now 14 years old. I'm deposited with, uh, in a small village with my aunt. And in 
fact, in the whole village, there were about 20 some odd Jews. I was related to every one of them. <laughs> my mother's side, my father's side, uh, my grandfather and grandmother are there, my brother are there. So we're in this village and a number of other details, but basically, this is like my home base, so to speak. And my parents go off to Budapest. Now, why? Because uh, the family's gotten used over the years to eat three meals a day. So somebody has to work. So my father goes up, mother goes to Budapest, you know, to get a job, do some business, whatever it is for my father, mother in Budapest. I am in this village, it's 1943, and uh, things are not bad. I have a whole bunch of cousins my age. Uh, we play soccer. I don't have to go too much to school. I don't speak Hungarian well anyway. So things aren't bad. And my aunt is a wonderful lady. She cooks well. Everything is marvelous. It's 1944. By 1944, things are improving. Why? Because by 1944, the German army is no longer invincible. By 1944, the German army is totally in control of all of Italy. They're about to invade the Second Front, possibly. They're bombing the living daylights out of Germany. The Russian army is already in Romania. In fact, they're losing the oil fields of Baku. Good stuff. Now, we know this. Why? Because the Hungarian newspaper covers it, not saying we're losing the war. Of course, it says, we have now reestablished the front west of such and such a city. And then a week later, we have established the front west of the other city. So it looks like it's moving. So things are looking up. So now it's a matter of survival. So that's what I hope for. The plan is simple. My father and mother are in Budapest. They make some money. They send us money. We're living. And wait. Unfortunately, in the spring of 1942, Germany, together with the ultra-Jew haters of Hungary, a political party called Nilash. The Nilash is straight arrow party, a cross arrow party, something like that. They decide it's time for the final solution of the Jewish question to come into Hungary. Though they were losing the war against, against the Allies, but against the Jews, they can still win the war. 44, right? What's that? In 44. In 44. The spring of 1944. A day after, in April, a day after Passover of 1944, every single Jew in Hungary is picked up the next couple, three days from his home and into a ghetto. Suddenly ghetto spring up. In different cities and towns, you have different areas. Uh, Many of them are Jews live, and of course, immediately you have a fence put around it, uh, and guards around it, and makeshift, but nevertheless, within a few days after that, most of the Jews of Hungary are put into a brick factory. And I think in, in, uh, in, in night, does he describe the brick Now, does he describe why? I don't remember. Now, the reason for why a brick factory? Now, well, have you ever been to a brick factory? No. Bricks are made out of clay, of course. And what you do, you have usually clays either brought in or you set up this factory close to a mountainside where you get the clay, it's mixed up with kinds of stuff uh, and everything else. And then bricks are, you know, these tan looking things are made up and they're wet. And the way you actually process them and become red bricks or some other color is by firing them. But before you fire them, they have to uh, air dry first. Because if you just put them into, the, uh, into a kiln, you'll find it's going to blow up. You know, those are the chemists, you know, what happens because they have air in there and water and it explodes. So what you do, you air dry them. So what you have is air drying sheds. What is an air drying shed? Uh, well, it has usually a metal or thatched roof with supports on all sides. And you put these bricks like this, like boom, 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 boom. And they sit there, and the air dries them. After about a couple of weeks or so, they become dry. Then you fire them, and off they get shipped by a train, right? So you have two things you have there. You have facilities where you have a roof and a railroad track. Two good things. 
Now you can bring the Jews from the ghetto into there. You have these long thatched, you know, these, these drying sheds. So all you have is a roof. And you have this place to be able to put family next to family and so on. And there are railroad tracks. So within a matter of a few days, or maybe a week, the train comes in. So I am in this place. Now, incidentally, I tried, my family, uh, at least part of my family, tried to run away, to hide, and be sort of betrayed, a whole bunch of stuff like that. But finally, I wind up in this brick factory with my grandparents, my brother, aunts, uncles, cousins. My parents are in Budapest. And suddenly, I'm in a railroad car. You know, a box. With no windows, no bathrooms, 90 people. There's a bucket. Stuffed together, half the people have to stand because there's not enough room. The train begins to move. One day, second day. By the third day, the train stops. It's nighttime. The doors are slid open, and one of the things I want to do is jump off the train. Because imagine being locked up in a space with half the people that to stand for three days and three nights with a bucket for waste. And no one washed. You can imagine what it smells like. So as soon as the train the doors open up, I jump off the train. And I'm all 14 years old, and I look around. What do I see? I see guards yelling and screaming at me, Raus! Achnell! Don't take anything with you. Leave everything in place. Make sure, since you have a name on your luggage, it will be delivered to you. I guess there were bellhops in Auschwitz. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and there are lights on this gravel platform like. And in the distance, I see chimneys, flames. Quite frightening. My parents are in Budapest. I'm here with my grandparents. And I'll tell you a by the way story, which I didn't remember until my cousin reminded me about it a few years ago. You'll see what kind of crazy people some of us are. We're standing in this formation. That's what it tells you. You have to stand formation and march. But before, as we're standing there, my cousin said to, says to me, what do you think that factory is making? You know, the flames coming out of it. I say, oh, they're going to make soap out of us, says Herb Roth. Mm -hmm. And he looks at me, I say, but, so you know what? If I become a bar of soap, I'll refuse to bubble. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't remember this. He told that story to a group of students. And he took a group of students from Israel, high school students, and they were in Auschwitz, standing on that platform, and he tells them this story. It was an interesting reaction, like they said. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? Laugh? Must be some character you cast. <laughs> but we're standing there for a few moments, and of course the line begins to move, and as the line begins to move, suddenly I came, come face to face with a man in uniform, who looks at me for an instant of time and says, Links, to the left! My brother, to the left. My grandmother, my grandfather, my aunt, my ten-year-old cousin, to the right. We separated. We marched off to another part of the camp, told to undress. We shaved from top to bottom, given a pair of striped pants and jacket, striped hat. Marched off to an area and standing formation. Counted, recounted. After many hours of standing there, we were allowed to go to the latrine. That's the kind of ditch that you pee into. And then we were allowed to go into a building, herded all of us, and there were these shelves. That's the only way to describe it. Uh, shelves like they have in uh, uh, warehouses that uh, have carpeting. You know, carpeting has long, you know, shelves. There are four of them. You know, one here on the, close to the floor, another one, and there's about two feet or so space in between, and we all go in there, and it's, it's basically shelves, and of course we're tired by this time, we're hungry and thirsty, uh, but, and we're very tired, so we go to sleep, but before we turn around, it's already a pal, mm -hmm. meaning you get up, 
and very quickly, there may be 10 minutes to be able to go again to the latrine, and then you have to stand in formation. And that was classical in every single camp. Every morning and every night you had to be counted. And they counted us. And with the right count, I guess. Because if you didn't, you stood there for hours sometimes, rain, shine, or whatever else, if the count wasn't right, if someone was missing. Now when I say missing, it doesn't mean alive. As long as the count of the bodies was right, everything was fine. If not, you stood there until they found you. Didn't matter whether you were dead or alive. After a while, we actually were given some hot liquid, which looked like coffee. Didn't quite taste it like it. And then we're standing again outside information, and we are called to like a little table. And there's somebody sitting on one side, and there's a chair on the other side. And said, you know, there are about six of these in front of us. We sit down, and he says, give me your arm, which I put down over here. And he takes something which looks like a hypodermic needle, and suddenly he is having a good time. And now I have a tattoo. It's called A10,491. I'm no longer Irving Roth. I have no name. I'm a number. Auschwitz is a particularly, that's one of the places that you got a number actually tattooed on. But most of the camps you did not. Now, obviously, who got the numbers? The people who were alive the next morning. Why? Because remember the night before we arrived? My grandparents and my aunt and cousins went the other way. And depending upon the age of the students, I tell them in detail what happened there. Or if they're, seven, if they're in the fifth grade or fourth grade, I don't go through the gory details of describing the gas chamber operation. I mean, so you know, uh, the gas chamber operation was a very uh, well organized because one of the things that you might think, here you have a mob of, we came a whole train full, it's about 4,000 people. 3,000 were taken to work and the rest of them into the gas chamber. So if I tell you you're going to go into the gas chamber, you're not going to be so happy with that, right? But this was a very well organized and thought out process. First thing that happened, men and women were separated because they're going to have a shower. That's very reasonable, right, to have a shower. After you've been in a train for three days and three nights, you need that because otherwise, A, you're dirty, two, you might get lice, I mean, all these stuff, bad news. So we're very careful of that. So we'll, you'll, go into the, you'll have a shower, and after the shower, you'll get, meet your other people who are going to, the, the men and the women will be together again and the people are working there someplace else, and everything is under control. So people say, not bad. You know, to get a shower, you hot shower, of course, you have to have some steam, right? You have to be heat. So that's why the chimney's out there, right? They're boiling water. And you come in into a lovely little area, which has lights around, and it has hooks on the wall. Why? Well, you have to put your clothing something if you're going to take a shower. <coughs> And each hook has a number on it. And you told him very great detail, make sure you remember. Because here you are, weighing 160 pounds, and you're putting your clothes on a hook, and somebody else, three hooks down, weighs 95 pounds, and you're going to get all mixed up. Not only that, one of the things, make sure that you tie your shoe shoes together so you don't mismatch them. You know, so, you know, and here is a bar of soap. And over this big sign on the, over the door, bathhouse. So you go in there. And you get in there, and you look up there, and lo and behold, in the ceiling, things look like shower heads. So far, so good. Soap in hand. The doors are closed, actually sealed. No water. Through the ceiling in Auschwitz, they had these little holes, trap doors, opens up, and a bunch of stuff comes down. Like crystalline stuff, uh, white crystalline stuff. As it comes down, smoke comes out of them. And suddenly you can't breathe. So, of course, people try to do something. They climb on each other because the higher go, go <coughs> and they, if you go to Maidanek today, and you go into the gas chamber there, you'll see, one of them at least, is a concrete one, and you'll see scratch marks. 
and turning blue-green from Zyklon B. Dead. Murdered. But there's some value to the bodies. Like the, some Jews are very sneaky. They held in their hand a gold ring. Right? Or maybe a diamond ring. And some of them had gold teeth. That's of great value. So the objective is first look at the corpses and extract that stuff and put it into a big bucket and you guard it, of course, because this is all done by Jews, by and large, who are members of something called the Zonderkommando. Their job was to go in there. That's the first thing they did. Then you put the bodies on a little gurney-like thing, and you shove them into the elevator. The elevator goes one flight up, and three bodies at a time into the crematory, into the crematory oven. And incidentally, a company in Germany has a, has a patent on the most efficient way to burn bodies. Three at a time, but special bodies. One, you get a very large body. And the other one, you do a standard body. And the third one, it's a very thin or small body. Because the very big, fat body, when the stuff begins to burn, supports the burning of a skinny body. Mm, mm, mm. There's a patent on that. Mm. If you want to look it up, it's a mm. top fair on zone. That's the name of the company that built the ovens and maintained them. Auschwitz had four major crematoria in 1944, and they were able to process. And mind you, the word you asked about extermination, the word is process, up to 10,000 bodies a day, 12,000 maybe. My grandparents, my aunts, uncles, my 10-year-old cousin, the next morning is nothing but smoke and ashes. But I got my tattoo, and I'm after some arrangements. A whole group of people is marched out of Auschwitz, out of Birkenau. And Birkenau is a death camp, in addition to be a concentration camp. And I think that's one of the things you want to make sure that Birkenau is a death camp. Because people were processed there, people were murdered there, and people were burned. We marched out of there to something called Auschwitz I. And Auschwitz had three major camps of many subcamps. Auschwitz I was a slave labor camp. Originally, it used to be a, a Polish army installation. And if you go there today, you'll see it. It looks wonderful. It's brick buildings, two-story brick buildings. Uh, look very pretty, nice straight rows. Poplar trees, double wire, uh, barbed wire fence, and all the stuff there. We marched there, and after some day or so, first I'm assigned to one place, and then I'm assigned to another place. I think it's a, again, I will not bore you with the details how I got from one, how I got from working in a gravel pit to working with horses. Uh, you'll read that. So my job is to work with horses. And what's the job? The job is to take care of horses and using them as workhorses, uh, mostly to plow the fields around Auschwitz. Because Auschwitz, uh, if you go today, of course, you have farms all over the place. Then there were farms also, some. But many areas were just sort of uh, swampy. So the job was to drain the swamps and convert it to arable land. So mind you, I'm 14 years old. I'm in Auschwitz. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. The whistle blows. I get up, like everybody else. By 3.30, we're outside, standing and being marched to the gate. The gate opens up. The big gate opens up, the big gate. And there's a, one of these railroad crossing kind of things. It opens up. On the other side, there are guards. They count us, making sure the right number is going out, and the, guard, the guards take charge of us. We marched out, and we marched to an area which is a field-like, and we have to get our horses. Now, I'm a city kid. I am told I have to, now I have the proud 
owner of two horses that I had to take care of. <laughs> First place, I never met the horse. No tag. The horse has no tag. So to find out who is, which is my horse and, and then, so you take these two horses and you have to now bring them to the, to the stable. So somehow you have to do that. So you have to put a bit into the horse and... Have you ever tried? <laughs> they don't like that. <laughs> They're not happy. But I somehow, after some kicking and screaming, you know, I get this. So now I'm now holding on to the two horses and now we form lines. Now mind you, it's four o'clock in the morning. It's Auschwitz. Very little traffic. It's not a Long Island Expressway. <laughs> but you have to march on the right-hand side. Because if you don't march on the right-hand side, bad business. The guard has a rifle. And that rifle has a butt to it. And that butt, when it hits you back, is very painful. So now, but the horses know that I have no idea what I'm doing. So they begin to, you know, like. But I learned very quickly because it was a question of, me getting hit or the horses, so the horses had to toe the line after a while. It took me a while. And then we take the horses to the stable and we clean the horses, we feed them, give them water. We get our breakfast, this black water. And by six o'clock in the morning, I'm out in the field. Now, again, there's a little problem. How do you, plowing the fields, you know the plow is, right? And if you plowed with horses before? Well, you have to hitch the horse, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to put a harness on a horse. How many of you are from a city? Not a farm. Do you know how to hitch a horse to a farm? You do? You have horses. Now, now it, it's a weird kind of thing, and I described this first day. Because you put this harness on top of the horse, or you throw it up. And you got, you know, so I do this, and of course it doesn't go high enough. It drops on the floor. Then I get all, all my strength, and I throw it again. It's on the other side, <laughs> and the whole thing is a sketch. And this guy is watching me. And fortunately, he had somewhat of a sense of humor, I suppose. After a while, he said, "Enough fun. Let me help. Let me show him how it's done." So I plow the fields from morning till night. At noon, we stop for 20 minutes. We get some soup. The horses rest. Continue the process until evening time. Evening time, we go back to the stables. We clean the horses, feed them, give them water, and we're march back back into camp. And it's a long day. We get a piece of bread and we go to sleep. The next morning, the process begins here. It's six and a half days a week. This is what we do. And those are the good days. On bad days, we march back at night. Because we were working with horses, had to take care of the horses in addition to everything else, other details, other work, for, work details came back earlier. We were the last ones usually in. So we come in, and some nights we walk back in, and rather than going directly into our building and wash up a little bit, because we had some, not a wash basin, these you know, uh, tubes, you know, like pipes and a little spigot down and a little water. We're taken to a shower. Now that in itself was not bad. The only problem was that on some occasion uh, you got undressed and you would walk into the shower, but on some occasion there'd be a man in uniform looking at you in an army uniform. Mostly a doctor, a German doctor look at you naked and determine if you should continue to live. Or not. Or feed the fires. He looked at you for an instant of time, said nothing, simply had a pad, and if you wrote the number down on your arm, on this pad, next morning you didn't go to work. You were picked up by a truck, taken to the gas chamber, and that was the end. Never knew. Is there going to be a selection today? That's why when somebody tells me, select one of the fruits, I get very nervous. Aww. Is there going to be a selection? And are you going to survive? Your life and death was in the decision of 
but my brother and I survived Auschwitz. The Russian army was 50 miles from Auschwitz in January of 1945. From here to Huntington. If you know where Huntington is, it's a lovely town. You imagine. And we know this. We know this. So it's, now it's hope. But on the 18th of January, the death march begins. So we get up like every other morning, marched out, new guards, different, more of them, and we marched different direction further into Germany. And we marched for three days and three nights with practically no food, hungry, tired, cold. <coughs> the guards set the pace because they only marched for two hours and then they four hours they try driving they go into a, a truck or in a wagon. We are marching. At the end of the third day, we come to a place called Gleibitz. Gleibitz was a uh, major, uh, those of you involved in railroads, major humping yard, which means that you form trains. You get, you know. And so there are trains there. And we march to the train. Now, these are different railroad cars. These are open cars. Mind you, it's January. Any of you been to Poland in January? <laughs> I don't recommend it. <laughs> April, much, May is a much better time. So we get into these trains, and of course we have you know, open cars, the train begins to move, and uh, somebody decides maybe he should jump off the train. He's shot, obviously. And the train finally stops, like in the middle of nowhere, told us to get out, and they march us, and mile or so down the road. Oh, we recognize the place. It's a camp. Because why? Because it has the same concrete stanchions, got the same barbed wire. Oh, going to the camp. And so now we are the seasoned campers. We'll see what this place is like. Uh, so we get into the camp and they march us into an area. And they tell us, go inside here into the little, and take all your clothing off. And we look in, and there are showers. Water! There's some buckets of liquid, uh, jellied soap. And imagine what, how wonderful it was to get some hot. Become for the first time in days to be actually warm. And normally the process, we sort of knew the process. I told sometimes students who were experienced campers. So you know the process. The next thing's going to happen. They took your clothing, it's full of lice, and you're going to get new clothing, not new. You know, clean. And the water stops, and we're told to go through a door. So we know now, in our own minds, that everything is OK, because we're going to live, right? We've got a shower, a real one. And we're told to go through that door. We go through that door, and there's like a hallway. And all of a sudden, we look there, and there seems to be no door at the end of the hallway. And all there is are pipes electric wires, a few bulbs. Oh my God, they fooled us. This is, we're not gonna get clothing there. Interesting enough, no panic broke out. I'm standing next to my brother, and he's, I say to him, doesn't look good. This may be the end of the line. He says, say a prayer. I say, naked? <laughs> Just close your eyes. And you're standing there, and I cannot tell you it was five minutes or a half hour. And suddenly this thing over there, like, opens up. And like, we look there, sunshine coming through. And we told to march, a pair of pants, and a jacket, and I'm alive. It's January 25th, 1945, and to some extent, I consider that to be the day I was born. That's why I look so young, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. You look yeah. young. Yeah, yeah. 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 I listen to the comment. <laughs> it's, it's, it makes me feel good. You know? yeah, it's good for the ego. <laughs> and of course, we marched out of the, out of the area. We got, uh, got our stuff to a 
barracks, and of course the barracks are now wooden barracks, and they have these four shelves, and but we lay down, and eventually we start, of course, we get some soup, and uh, so, you know, we'll see what happens. Maybe there's some work and so on. And what happens in Buchenwald, it's really worse in a way than Auschwitz, because in Auschwitz we've got black stuff for breakfast, some soup for lunch, and a piece of bread. In Buchenwald, things were not so good. Uh, you got maybe some soup a whole day. Maybe a boiled potato. Some days there was no food. People began to die. They developed dysentery. Uh, all kinds of things. People got sick. And so Buchenwald was a pretty, and there was no real work going on in Buchenwald. There was some make work, like carrying rocks from one place to another and back again and so on, for me. And eventually what happens, I mean, every morning, of course, every night you have this thing called Appel. I remember I told you about it. You have to stand in formation and you're counted. And we do this, the roll call every single day, morning and night. And then one day, we, in the end of February, we have a roll call. My brother's standing next to me, or practically next to me, and uh, we, counted and everything is okay, but we, can't, we are not dismissed. What happens, a man in uniform comes along and takes about 100 people away. My brother is one of them. It was the last time I saw him. Aww. And eventually what happens to the young people in this group, we take them from there and put into another part of the camp. That's the camp you met in Buchenwald, called the Kleinlager, a small camp. You've heard of fellow Elie Wiesel? Yeah. yeah. Elie Wiesel and I slept in the same room in Buchenwald. I thought so, because you're following the same of course. that he did. Yeah. So the difference between Elie Wiesel and me is the fact that he got the Nobel Prize. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't get it yet. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I love yeah. that. There's still time. There's still time. No rush. <laughs> so we're in this place in this Klein Lager, the small camp. And things are not great. But we have a block tester, the man who is in charge of the block, of the building, who is a marvelous fellow. He is a prisoner, he's a, pri a political prisoner from Czechoslovakia, from the Czech Republic. And he really does care about us for the best he can. Of course, the food is not there and all this stuff. And there are a couple of things that I remember very clearly during this whole period of time. One story is that one night, as we're standing in Appel, we counted, and we normally go back, and then you hit the sack, so to speak, you know. He says, the guys on this side, don't climb in. I want you to all to sit around, because we have a special treat. In walks a guy who's very skinny, and has a piece of paper about the size of this. Maybe a little bigger a piece of charcoal. And he says, I'm going to teach you about ge geometry. <laughs> <laughs> he begins to talk about, I, I remember correctly, how two triangles are congruent. <laughs> <laughs> it's Bohobal. But you know, for that period of 45 minutes or so, all these people, 14, 15, 16 years old, were not in Buchwald. We were in the classroom. For that moment, we were human beings in a class trying to understand that if two sides and one angle is the same, the two, the angle, the two triangles are congruent. There was another one, similar. He again, at the end of the thing, he says, I want you to sit around. And in comes a man in one of these, you know, striped pants jacket, but the jacket was a very long one. And out of it, he brings out a violin and a bow. And he said he's going to play a piece of music, an original piece of music that he composed in his head in the train coming from Theresienstadt to Bochum. So the premiere performance of that piece of music was in Block 66 in Bochum. I tell you this because 
it's important to understand what people did. He couldn't give us extra food. But he thought of us as human beings. He didn't call us Schweinhuden. Eventually what happens is the American army is getting closer as April comes along. And again, you have a death march. And every day we try to hide, and we do, because by this time I weigh 70 pounds. Not exactly what you would call it. overweight. We hide. I hide under a building in the crawl space. Day after day, I'm doing well. By the 10th of April, I'm hiding there. A guy comes along with a dog, one of the guards, gets us out, marches to the front of the camp, and uh, we're going to be marching out. It's 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock in the morning. They're forming these lines, these long lines, about 8,000 people or so. Because every day they took five, six, seven thousand 7,000 people. This is like the last group. And as we're standing at 11 o'clock in the morning, suddenly the siren goes off. An air raid! And American planes are overhead. Wave after wave of planes. So the commander obviously decides this is not a good thing. Because if I let these people march out with the guards, what if the guard gets killed by a bomb? The Jews will run away. <laughs> I am responsible for making sure that every Jew is accounted for, dead or alive. So I'm going to wait. The air raid lasted all day long. By 3.30 in the afternoon, the air raid still goes on. He says, go back to your barracks, and I survived another day. Next morning, you know, what are we going to do? I'm going to try and hide. Maybe the dog will be someplace else. But nothing's happening. By 11 o'clock in the morning, all the guards surrounding the camp and the outside disappeared. And at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, two American soldiers walk into our building. One was black, one was white. Now, you may have pondered the idea when the Messiah will come. I saw them. I can describe them to you. Healthy, strong, unafraid. Looked at us. They've never seen skeleton shuffling before. These two guys broke down and cried. So obviously, what do you do with skeletons? You feed them. You find they found food outside of the camp in a warehouse, pork and split peas. They brought it in. They cooked it up and fed it to us. You can imagine, here's a bowl you have and you... I didn't eat, I inhaled it. Uh, and got very sick, of course, yeah. because I ate too much, and you know, the, you know where I spent most of the night. Anyway, <laughs> after, the, yeah. the, after the next morning, the American army also travels with doctors, so the doctors come in and says, don't kill these people with <laughs> too much food, and they begin to take care of us. Uh, one day they took all the kids in this Block 66, marched us out, uh, past the warehouse where we were able to go in and get new clothing, all German army uniforms, into a new building where the guards used to live, and now we have food, and we have uh, chocolate, and we dress properly as bathrooms, and have beds, mattresses, you know, like, oh my God. Of course, I'm alone. I realize I'm alone after the euphoria of being alive. So what do you do? Well, after a while, we decided that I met, I didn't know anybody, but one day I met a friend from school, Bernie. Uh, Bernie and I meet, and it's so happy with two of us from our town. We know each other. What are we going to do? We're going to go back to Czechoslovakia after the war. If we survive, maybe somebody else did too. So the war is over. A month later, transportation becomes available. I go back to the village from where I was taken. I figure if anybody survived, they'll be there. Come to the village, the first person I see, did, I say, did anybody from the Roth family survive? He says, yeah. I say, where? Where are they? You know, it's a small village. So he points to a house. I don't know where. I open the door. And there is my mother. Aww. So I say, hi, Mom. Aww. Aww. Oh my God. Of course, my mother didn't quite say hi. She fainted. Yeah. <laughs> my mother and father survived. Aww. And mind you, they were in Budapest. Before the Jews of Budapest were being taken, my father got very sick, went into a coma. So he was in a hospital, non-Jewish hospital. And 
Everyone gave up, of course, you know. You're in a coma for a week. It's over. And everybody gave up except for one person, a night nurse, a seven-day Adventist night nurse, mm. who decided that it's her mission in life to try and bring my father back to life. And what she did is she made sure that the IV is flowing, made sure the oxygen is flowing, made sure he doesn't get bed sores, and talked to him every single night. And after a number of weeks, she's talking to him, and he, she sees his mouth move. And he's like whispering, she thinks. And he says, as clear as can be, because everybody said it, even if he survives, he's going to be a vegetable. As clear as can be, how long have I been asleep? Oh. A miracle. The man comes back to life, not a vegetable. Walks, talks, eats. So now he is in good shape physically. But now the Jews of Budapest are being put into trains sent to Auschwitz. And if they don't have trains, they dump him into, they shoot him and dump him into the Danube. This wonderful lady said to my parents, you need a place to hide. My apartment. Come to my apartment. I'm going to leave the door open. Make sure no one sees you. Come in. We'll build a hiding space in case somebody comes and looks for Jews. I live there. This is a one-bedroom apartment with my daughter, who is married. Has a husband who is in the Hungarian Nazi army, so he's in the front lines fighting the Russians. And she has a daughter. My parents get there. No one sees them, of course. They make sure. And, you know, food becomes a bit of a problem because even if you can go out, you can't. You can't go to a supermarket with your SUV and fill it up with shopping cart. Uh, people would know you're hiding Jews. That's not a good thing because somebody will squeal because they get a few bucks for it. And they'll be shot at them. So, uh, so she has to be very circumspect in trying to get uh, food. And, but uh, she is there and, and soldiers come to look for Jews and they don't find them. <clears throat> One night, there is a knock on the door. The son-in-law comes home for three days. He's a Nazi soldier. So as my mother is relating this story, I said, so what happened? He says, well, the wife, of course, is very happy to see him, hugs him, kisses him, you know, wonderful to be home, and because he's alive and only is he alive, he's whole, wounded. But now she has a problem. There are two Jews there. So she proceeds to tell her husband that we have two relatives living with us. Actually, they're hiding. <laughs> and uh, they must, nobody must find out because if, they find, if anybody finds out, they're going to be shot uh, in the courtyard. And if you want to go to bed with me tonight, you're going to keep your big mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> After my mother told me that, I had tremendous respect for sex. <laughs> I still do. <laughs> my parents survived because someone cared. Essentially, someone cared. And that, my friends, is essentially the story. Someone cared. Someone did not stand by and do nothing. They saw an opportunity rather than a, she saw an opportunity to do something great, saving two human lives. If you don't go to heaven for that, you go to heaven for nothing else. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And that's the message. Don't stand by and do nothing. I told this story many times. About two years ago, three years ago, I told this story to a group of fifth graders, about 150 of them. And one of the fifth graders raises his hand and states this whole educational, in a very simple statement. Mm -hmm. If you stand by and do nothing, and let the bully do what he wants, you're helping the bad guy. He got it. 
Stand by and do nothing, you're helping the bad guy. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. <laughs>